want to welcome those that are joining us outside this building, our churches across the world, Victoria in Africa. We want to say welcome to Calvary Worship Center as we continue our series on joy. We are studying the book of Philippians for those who are visiting us for the first time. We continue our series also on landmines this Friday night. If you have never been to our Friday night service, let me encourage you to show up. Last, sun, last Friday night, it was something else. We moved some mountain and uprooted some principalities and powers. And this Friday will continue. Please come because I believe God wants to help you avoid the landmines that will destroy your destiny, your future for the glory of God. But the devil is a liar. Amen. Amen. And God is good. Today we are going to look at Philippians chapter 2. Finally, we are there. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Paul says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Fulfill my joy. I want to speak to you on the subject, what makes a joyful church? What makes a joyful church? Just in these four verses, Paul is encouraging us how to create an environment of joy in the community. How to create Laughter. Life is very harsh and we go through a lot. Whether in our workplaces, in our relationships, at home, everywhere, life is very harsh. And when we come into the house of God, it should be a safe place where our joy will be made full. It must be a place when we go to, we can understand and know that when we leave that sanctuary, whatever be our situation, whether it's sorrow, depression, discouragement, the church has to be a place when people get to, their joy must be full. Oh, I'm getting some few amens. I want to be part of a church that is so joyful. In fact, I've, I've had some testimony about people who joined this church just because they saw people on the parking lot and the way they were happy, they said, I want to go and check out the church. The church is different from going to a funeral. When you come out of church and you are feeling sad, you've gone to the wrong place. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of God. Why was he glad? Because he knows. I really don't want to step on any of these precious Thanksgiving card. Thank you. David knew that if he enters the house, something else will turn around. Can you help us, every one of us here, listen to me, to create that environment of laughter? Where people are attracted to this place. Because this place, when you get there, your mouth will be full of laughter. Amen. We have to make a conscious decision to create that type of atmosphere. I mentioned to you a few weeks ago that joy comes primarily through two areas. Our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. To make that happen, there are certain things, Paul says, that need to happen. 
In fact, in Psalm 16, the psalmist says, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent one in whom is all my delight. People are meant to bring you joy. We are not meant to bring one another's down, gossip, backbiting, comparing ourselves. That belongs to the world. When people come here, they must feel glad because they know they are going to meet people who are going to make them feel joyful. Turn to a neighbor and say, make me joyful. Turn to the next person and say, you owe me. You owe me joy. Turn to the person behind you and say, make my joy complete. How many of you have been through a very difficult week? Let me see you by hands. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Somebody get up on your feet and go and give them a hug. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Let me make your joy. Look at that. Look at that. Let me make your joy complete. Oh, I love that. I love that. How do you feel? Don't you feel good? Okay, okay, okay. I think enough of the hug. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Love to see men really give real, genuine hugs. Paul said, make my joy full. So there are four things that need to happen. When I was praying this morning, God was talking to me about the sounds of laughter. I haven't yet fully understood what he was saying. But the church must create the sound of laughter. That's what the church is supposed to be. We don't come here and live here worse than we came in. You must be glad when they said unto you, let us go into the house of the Lord. So first principle Paul says in verse 1, what must we do? One, you must display care. I wanted to put the word care in your notes. We need to care deeply for one another. And that will create that environment and that impact. Let's go to verse 1. Therefore, he says, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affections and mercy. Let me break this. The first thing he's talking about is consolation. If there is any consolation, you carry consolation. The word consolation is a Greek word meaning paraclesis. Paraclesis simply means to encourage, to motivate, to not necessarily to bring down, but to move up. It means to stir somebody's spirit. If there is any consolation in Christ, there are different ways we can encourage people. We can encourage people through our words. We can encourage people by telling them something. Even by saying shalom to somebody. There is an encouragement. Somebody who has been going through some rough week or a rough day. When you say shalom, you're encouraging the person. You may turn to somebody and say, I don't know you, but I sense God is telling me to tell you something. Or you may turn to somebody and say, how are you? Where, where is, if, if you say, how are you? And he, and he goes, I am fine. You go, wow, where is that accent from? You started a conversation. I come from Ouagadougou. <laughs> Tell me something about Ouagadougou. That's what church is meant to be. It sickens me when all that we know about church is high and off the door. Some people even don't say hi. As soon as the offering, even before the offering, they dash out. If there is consolation in Christ, you carry something. If you have been consoled, take that same consolation. If you have been encouraged, extend it. That's what church is about. Church is not about going to a theater and go and listen to a good sermon and go home. That's not the church. It is ecclesia, the gathering of the people of God, where we come to move one another. 
to pray for one another. Sometimes you can tell somebody is feeling heavy. Somebody needs some encouragement. You say, brother, can I pray for you? And you pray for the person. I am talking about the creating that atmosphere. Is that kind of church I want to be part of? Is that okay? Praying for one another. Giving gifts. Try this. Maybe every Sunday put $20 in your pocket. Make it 50 Say, God, I know that there's somebody in the church this week that might need this $20. You don't know how much that $20 will mean to somebody. The value of it cannot be measured in dollars. Say, sister, I don't know, but I feel like God, I should give you the $20. I know somebody who does this in the church and always has tears. Say, you have no idea. I'm not even sure how I'm going to go home after church. I don't even have a bus pass. We also encourage each other through our singing. I say singing. See, when we come here, we are not just singing to God. We are also singing to one another. Do you know that? Your songs can encourage somebody. I can't begin to tell you how many times people have come to me and said, Pastor, I was so down by the way I saw the sister dance. I knew that God is still on the throne. Just your movement, your, your worship can encourage somebody to say, he may, he may not have showed up right now, but he has showed up to me. And my God will turn up and open door for you as well. Yeah. This is what for, Paul means. Look at Colossians. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing, that's a word, encouraging one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs. Singing with grace. God said, encourage each other with songs. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. For the Lord is on the throne. Things are getting better. Some of you, when you are singing, you've closed your eyes. Sometimes you have to open your eyes and sing it to somebody. Because the Bible says you need to sing to one another. Turn to your neighbor and say, can I sing to you? <laughs> Sometimes you don't have the words, but that music can do it. I've had somebody call me and say, Pastor, there's a song on my heart, but I can't sing it. But listen to, this, to the music. Then she sent me the link. Sometimes that's all that you need to do. Send somebody the link. Some of you, if you can't sing it, don't, don't, don't force it. Sometimes it's better you send a link. Turn, turn to somebody and say, send the link, send the link. Because sometimes your singing can bring somebody down. <laughs> just, I really want to sing this song for you, but, but just listen to the link. That's what the body of Christ, see, you're all laughing. This is what church is supposed to be like. I know some of you are going through something, but it doesn't mean that you cannot laugh. Be of good cheer. Though you go through tribulation. In this world, you shall have tribulation. I want you to join me to create that kind of environment. Yeah. It should be a happy environment. A place of joy. Say, come on, I'm feeling down. Come to my church. I am sure that somebody will reach out to you. Singing to one another. When we, I am praising God, I'm lifting. Our worship is not just vertical. It's also horizontal. If there be any consolation, any encouragement. The next thing he talk about, about taking care. How do we take care of people? He says, any comfort of love. Comfort of love. Why is Paul mentioned comfort? You know, life happens. Life happens. Either you have just come out of it, or you are about to enter into it. <laughs> Amen. Or you are just riding it. And every one of us, once a while, we need somebody to cheer us up. So when somebody asks you, how are you? Don't just say, good. Say, I'm going through some tough times. Let's be brutally honest with each other. And if somebody tells you, I am going through a tough time. If it's an emotional issue, spiritual issue, pray for them. If it's financial, sometimes you have to help them. If you can bless them, don't just say, I'm praying for you. 
Sometimes you're, you are the answer to the prayer. Somebody say, you know, I don't even know what, what, how I'm going to eat dinner today. The Bible says in 1 John, don't say, God bless you. Say, you don't know, let me pray for you. After that, I'm going to give you some dollars. Sometimes our action is that kind that Paul is talking about. Talking about joyful environment. Any comfort. People who are hurting and grieving. One of the things I've realized is that, and that is sad. When people are going through something, the last place they want to be is a church. That's sad. You know why? Because either we will not care or we will judge them. So when we are going through something, we avoid church. When we are okay, then we come to church. That must not happen. There must be some consolation in Christ. Brothers and sisters, there is consolation in Christ. And the church must provide that encouragement. The church must be an encouragement zone. That when people walk through these doors, we must be able to say they will be encouraged no matter what. Ask your neighbor, are you going through something? Let's practice. Are you going through something? Turn to the person and said, shalom, shalom, perfect peace be unto you. I can't pray for you right now, but I can pray for you after the service. Let create that environment where there is true honesty and genuineness. That will attract other people. Because you know that if you bring your friends here, they will receive consolation, they will receive comfort. Then the next thing, how do we take care of people? It talks about the communion of the spirit. If there be any consolation, release it. If there is comfort, release it. Because it creates joy. And then it says if there is any communion. That word communion means fellowship. Fellowship. Now I want to speak to those who run away every Sunday after church. This message is for you. Fellowship. Communion of the spirit. Remember that he said the consolation is of Christ. The communion is of the spirit. Whenever we share the grace, we say may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, we are talking about the comfort, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. When we recite the grace, we are admitting that care is our primary goal. God is coming to console you through the grace of Christ. Then he said, the love of God, you comfort. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In other words, fellowship comes from our relationship with the Spirit. The Spirit loves to hang out. If you're a child of God and you're afraid of people, something is wrong with you. Pray that God will help you. It may be some brokenness, it may be some hurt, it may be something. But every one of us, God has created us with the ability to give love and receive love. And this takes place in the fellowship of the spirit. We think that hanging out with people is not part of church. You are wrong. When the service is over, I believe that's when the other service begins. Where you take your, take five minutes of your time before you run away because that fellowship will encourage somebody and bring joy to somebody. Paul said fellowship, comfort, communion in the spirit. When we are not hanging out, people think that hanging out is just a waste of time. Let me tell you something, my friend. I love social media. But so, social media cannot replace fellowship. What social media has done, has, done, have, has done right now to us, it has made us more and more isolated. It has increased and even baptized our individualism. Everybody is always on the phone. Everybody is watching something. People don't have time. Let me tell you something that happened to Africa. When I was growing up, every evening, a group of people would gather outside. 
and just talk. They will just talk. Don't ask me what they talk about. They just talk. And every evening, once we have our dinner, we go out to hang out. You find a group, you join in. You don't need an agenda. You don't need to apply. You just join in and you talk. You want to know why some part of the world, they have so much joy? Because people hang out. Even when they have watched the same movie. Everybody have watched the same movie. After the movie, they have to gather to talk about the movie. Even in the movie, sometimes they will ask the person showing the movie to stop. So that they can talk to each other before they can continue. In the movie, people chat. This is a place where a movie theater you don't talk. Say, Shh, why show me? I need to fellowship. <laughs> and then when the movie is over, everybody don't fellowship. We all go home the same. Why don't you tell me what taught you about the movie? Let me tell you something. And then came DVDs and television. It is all disappeared. By 7.30, 8pm, latest 9pm, the streets in my country is empty. Everybody is home watching television. This is what technology has done to us. And even here it's worse. Because it's not easy to leave your entertainment induced environment to go out and have coffee with somebody. And yet you are depressed. Facebook cannot stir your spirit up. It takes the communion of the believers. And you have to make a conscious effort. My wife and I, every week, we at least make a conscious effort to have dinner with somebody. It's our way of fellowship. We don't talk about church necessarily. We just want to hang out. Jesus saw Zacchaeus on top of the tree. He said, Zacchaeus, calm down. For what? It wasn't for crusade or altar call. He said, I simply want to hang out with you. Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus' house. He said, I want to have dinner with you. And in fact, they did that. They went home and they started having dinner. There were lots of laughter. Out of it, Zacchaeus got up and repented. Jesus didn't preach, didn't do altar call. Just fellowship. Sometimes, I'm giving you permission, you need to invite yourself to people's home. Because if you don't do it, it's never going to happen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Maybe you find a nice way. You say, oh, I was just in the neighborhood and I, I just thought I should ring your bell. Some of you, when people ring your bell, you go, who? Who is this? You are shocked. Why are you shocked? Are we expecting somebody who will run the bed? Go check who is the bed. Fellowship. And if he's a pastor, it's even worse. Everybody goes under the chair. Try that. Practice that this week. Just show up. Ring the bell. Test the person. I know you are home. I see your car. <laughs> Can you imagine what will happen to this church when we start to visit each other? Fellowship. You are home watching, cannot shut it down and talk to somebody. Somebody says, are you free? No, I'm watching a football game on Thursday. Now, what about Friday night? I'm, I'm busy. I am, what about, why? And you, you begin to realize that your life, your joy is not full. Because you are not connecting See, we God created us to connect. Are you hearing me? Tell us to connect. Because the spirit that you have dwells in a community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is a hanging out. Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit hanging out. And that's the spirit that you have received. So when you have the spirit of God and you don't like to fellowship, then my friend, let me ask you, what kind of spirit do you have? Because that spirit wants to communion the fellowship of the spirit. Try this. 
Every Sunday, say, I want to meet one stranger. See how that would change this church. Say, every Sunday, I want to meet. Don't just go and hang out with the same old people, the people that you know. Say, this Sunday, I want to meet a total stranger. Randomly say, hi, introduce yourself. That act alone can bring joy into somebody's house. If there be any compassion for one another. Let me quote you 1 John 3, 1 John 1. Now, these are, see, fellowship in the spirit is not just a waste of time. It, these are part of some deep spiritual truth. Look at what John is saying. I won't read all. Watch this. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. You need to have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And then, listen to this. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Your joy is going to depend on your fellowship with us. He is saying that we should fellowship in the, even more deeply. When you keep reading verse 7 and 8, he said, when we fellowship with one another, the blood of his son Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That scripture has always baffled me. In other words, when people are hanging out, there is something deep happening beyond the surface. Even cleansing and washing. And that is why Zacchaeus could repent. Something is taking place when you are saying your hello, I love you, comfort, encouraging. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ is at work. Yeah. It's powerful. Maybe one day we'll come to this subject. Then he talks about the compassion for one another. He said not only do, I, do, do should we console, comfort, communion, if there be any compassion, any he said, talk about affections and mercies. It is the antidote to our brokenness and depression. Wow. Look at this in John 15. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is how your joy becomes full. You show compassion. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. God said when we begin to love each other in the true caring way, we produce joy. Produce joy. Wow, and that's only point one and my time is almost up. Jesus, help me. How do we as children of God create an environment of joy? Number two, write it down. We need to develop, Paul says, cooperation. I'm going to go there a bit fast on the end. Develop cooperation. Let's look at verse 2. So verse 1, he says, display care. Verse 2, he says, you need to develop cooperation. He said, fulfill my joy. How? By being like-minded, having the same love, being one accord and one mind. Live in unity because unity, Paul says, produces joy. Can I show you one passage? Acts chapter 2, verse 46. I'm not dwelling here because I... We, we talked a little bit about this last Sunday. But let me give you one verse. Look at the church in unity. What happened? So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. See what I told you? That's what I'm talking about. There was fellowship here. They went not only in the temple. Go back to the next verse. Let, 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 let me show something. They went in the temple and they went from house to house. That's church. That's church. House to house, try it. Print out some address from church members and go from house to house. You don't need to cook. I just, just put some lemon in some hot water and I'm fine. That's all. It doesn't cost much to get a lemon. You don't have to cook, cook the whole stuff. Just want to hang out. The food is just a medium. I'm here just to talk, talk about life and laugh. When was the last time you really loved that it really hurts? That's the way God created you. God, any way you think joy and laughter, is throughout the word of God. 
we have become too uptight. I say uptight. Turn to someone and say, loosen up, loosen up, loosen up. Look behind you and say, loosen up, loosen up, loosen up. Too uptight. Continue daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. Listen to this. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. This is church. This is the early church. As you move and fellowship and move in unity with one accord, the Bible says it produces gladness and simplicity of heart. Number three, how do we create an environment of joy? Paul says we need to de denounce conceit. Write the word conceit. Deny conceit. So verse one, he said develop. Uh, verse one, he said you, you have to care, display care. Number two, develop cooperation. Verse two, verse three, he said you have to denounce deceit. So he gets to the next verse, watch this. Verse three. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. You see, wherever there is competition, it creates pain, discouragement. Because the world out there, they have their values. Your value depends on your education. It depends on how much money you have, even where you live. It depends on how many titles you have before or after your name. It's not just enough that you have got masters. The world wants to know where you got your masters. Because people always want to place you. So when they ask you, how are you? They want to know, how do I place you on this ladder in the world? Give me something about your education. Are you married? Are you single? That also will add value. And what do you drive? It might, we all know that. Don't look at me like, you all know that. And that's why we buy cars that we cannot afford. Why? Value. Because people need to place you. And you don't want to be misplaced. That is why even when you live in Suri, you have to define which Suri. <laughs> I live in North Suri. Why the North? Because you don't want to be identified with Central Newton or... Wally. <laughs> How many people have you met to say, I live in Wally? You either live in North Surrey or South Surrey. Yeah. Why is that important? Placement. When people come into the church, we need to lay down those placements at the door. Because it doesn't bring joy. Because we are battered, we are kicked, we are made to feel like we are nobody because we haven't achieved that or been that or been there. Have you ever be, met people like that? Even before you say hello to them, they want to tell you where they have been. Oh, I was just with Trudeau yesterday. <laughs> Even if you are talking about hamburgers, it will come back to Trudeau. I was just talking to him. Look, I can show his number. In fact, I can call to Trudeau right now. Do you want to say hello to him? <laughs> Why is that is important? Placement. That's the world. Sometimes it sickens me when he comes into the church. Next Sunday we will talk about descending into greatness. What it means for Jesus who is everything to lay it at our side. And the Bible says let this mind be in you. It's a, humility is a certain way of thinking. Don't think like the world because that's the only thing they have is to measure one another. When you weigh 20 pounds, you are valuable. If you are weigh more than 20 pounds, you might not get a job. Because people equate failure value to your weight. The scale has power. Yes. If you are fat, you are not valuable in this society. You better lose weight. You might not even get a wife or a husband. So that man, I love him. Actually, it's a true story. But his stomach is a bit. I'm not mentioning names. I'm not talking names. Pastor, I'm not in love with him. Why? The stomach is a bit enlarged. And that's what the Bible means. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Somehow, sometimes, the worst way of thinking can affect can affect how
how we think. We must not bring those values in church. Let me tell you the church way. Can I show you? Romans chapter 12 verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, Paul says, to everyone who is amongst you, myself, everybody, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think what? Soberly, as God has dared to each one a measure of faith. That's the joyful way. It's not important. There are medical doctors here. You may never know. It's not important. There are nurses here. There are people who are filthy rich in this church. It's not important. It's not important to let me know whether you live in West Van or who knows. It's not important. The most important thing is we are brothers and we are sisters and that's what matters. Please don't place me. Because at the foot of the cross, we are all when there is pride and haughtiness it creates a very toxic environment everybody is comparing themselves where you live, what house you buy and all the rest that's a way of thinking in the world anyway let me stop I'll continue next week to understand what it means to have the spirit of humility so it's that I have rights I have privileges I have I have attained things, but I lay it down. It takes a certain type of spirit to say, in the world, I am somebody. When the man met Jesus Christ, the centurion, he said, look, I know when I say this, they do. And I say go, they go. I know what authority is. But I lay it down. Because at this point, my child is sick and I need help. Can you lay your crowns down? Because if you don't do it, the Bible says on the last day when we get to heaven, we will lay our crowns at the altar. Why? Because at that point, Christ is the one that value. Many times when we think we are somebody, we forget the source and the grace of God upon us. How many of you have watched the, the movie, The Beautiful Mind? True story. A brain, a mind that can go off overnight. You think you are somebody. God turned Nebuchadnezzar into an animal because he thought he was somebody. You need to know God that whatever I have, whatever I've, I've achieved, whatever I have gone, how far I've gone is because of your grace. And when you understand grace, you never think highly more than you need to think. Why is Paul going about talking about he's the worst of sinner, he's the worst of the apostle, he's this, this, this. He has understood grace. Can I show you something? 1 Corinthians chapter 4. For who makes you different from anyone else, he says. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Tell me. Paul, Paul is saying, tell me. Everything that we have is by the grace of God. And we should not let that come between fellowships. I don't hang out with these people. These low people. I just hang out with just doctors. Class, just tell me who you are and then I'll give you my number. If you tell me we are homeless, please don't call me. And yet the Jesus that we serve, hang out with homeless people, prostitutes, tax collectors, and all that. That's the spirit of Christ. Or may I say more? He says, yes, if we need to. Let me give you the final one and we close. Number four. How do we create a joyful environment? He said we must demonstrate cons consideration one another. These are very deep words and brothers and sisters, I want you to go home and reread this passage once again. Say, God, speak to me. Display care, develop cooperation, denounce deceit, demonstrate consideration. The final verse, verse 4. He says, F Philippians, please, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Are you frozen? Thank you. F Philippians 2, 4. He said, don't look out only for your own interests. But take an interest in others too. That's the Christian way. Somebody defined joy. The secret of joy is this. J for Jesus first. O for others second. And Y yourself last. That's how we produce joy here. You lay your, yourself down. 
when I enter into this zone, I'm entering into joyful zone, I want to look at others better than myself. I want to look at their own interests. You know what? I really wanted to go and do A, B, and C, but you have a need. I can put my interest down. That's what I'm talking about. Many times we are so selfish. We talk about me, myself, and I. And the whole world even sanctifies that. But when you are a child of God, God calls us not to consider just ourselves, but consider the interests of others. This is the word of God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. What does it say? Number one, we need to display care for one another. Let's care for each other. Number two, we need to develop cooperation. Number three, we need to denounce conceit. And finally, we need to demonstrate consideration. These are deep things. These are heavy things. But it's something that we can do through the power of God. Will you bow your head and say, God, speak to me. I want to be part of that church. I don't want to pull down, destroy. I want to be part of a joyful church. And Lord, I know that I have a part to play. The least you could do is stand hello to somebody, shalom to somebody at the end of the service. Join me, my friends. Let's create this joyful environment at Calvary Worship Center. Let the whole city know that this place, when you come in there, you'll be full of joy. Not just the joy of relationship with Jesus, but with one another. Let me give you, let, let, let me just stand aside for a moment and allow God to just talk to God about these areas. There could be one or two areas, three areas that you, you say, God, I need to work on these. Spirit of God, help me. You need joy. You, you are too isolated, too individualistic. God wants us to care for somebody, share the love of somebody. God is calling us, every one of us. Will you? Let me give you a few seconds to pray. Father, we, we recognize that you've called us to be the church, to reflect your love and reflect the joy that dwells in the Trinity. We live in a broken world that gives us all kinds of attractions and temptations. Father, we lay it at the cross. This is where we want to laugh out loud. and This is where we want to have joy and experience true happiness that comes from you, from one another. Holy Spirit, make me a blessing. Help me, O oh God, to make somebody's joy complete, full to the overflow. Joy comes from God. And God is the only one that can give you joy. You know, as we close our service today, I believe there are people here in this service that say, Pastor, I, I, I don't know about this joy you're talking about. I don't have relationship with God. I want to pray for you. Something is missing in me. and I don't know what it is. I thought it was money. I've tried money. I'm still empty. I moved to Canada. I'm still feeling empty. You need to have a relationship with Jesus. The Bible says, in me you shall have joy. The fullness of joy. If you are here today and you don't know Jesus, and maybe you, you used to know God and you've walked away from God and you find yourself so far away from God, but today God has spoken to you. I'm going to ask you to do something very, very courageous. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat, come forward so that I can pray for you. Otherwise, I may not know who you are. We want to pray for you. We don't want to embarrass you. Jesus died for us publicly. He calls us publicly. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. God is a solution to your brokenness and your pain. In the moment, I'm going to ask you to do the right thing. You might be the only one in this room. That's okay. Give us opportunity to pray for you, to help you begin a new journey. And God will give you a purpose. The floor is going to be open. Like I said, it's going to take courage. You know you need it. You need God in your life. I'm going to ask you to step forward. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God is here to give you joy and peace to change your life. Will you do that? Amen. Amen.